Okay, so this is a video I'm posting for naming. Um, it truly is not a difficult thing, but you do have to take the time to, one, recognize that while it's not difficult, it's not straightforward. There is some thought that needs to be done before you write down a formula or write out a name. Okay, but there's some simple just things to remember to help you get through them. Okay, so this slide looks like there's a lot of information, but this is just a list of helpful things to remember related to ionic compounds versus covalent molecules. Okay, so ionic compounds are named for the fact that they're made from ions. So you have to have a cation and an anion, so something that's positive and something that's negative. Generally speaking, that's going to be a metal and a nonmetal. Okay, and the only exception to that is a, you could, instead of the metal, you could have a polyatomic ion. All right. But regardless, your key indicators to know you're working with ionic is one, you have a metal, or you have at least one polyatomic ion. Okay. Ionic compounds are always going to form in the simplest ratio that cancels out the charge. So all of the positive charge must be canceled out by the negative charge. Okay. So Ultimately, in just about any reaction that you write, it has to be overall neutral. So you never put the ions alone in a reaction. Okay. So, the trick to ionic compounds is figuring out your ions. Okay. And there's three major groups of them. There's your representative elements, which are those groups 1 through 8. And those have known charges. Okay. Just to do a quick review on that, um, if you think about your periodic table, you've got group 1, which is hydrogen, group 2, which begins with beryllium, and then you jump all the way over to the other side of the periodic table, group 3 with boron, group 4 with carbon, group 5 with nitrogen, 6 with oxygen, seven with fluorine, and then eight with your noble gases. Each group forms one kind of charge. Okay. Um, I mean, it's based on the fact that the number of valence electrons matches the group number. At the low end, they're going to give up those electrons and make positive ions. So we've got plus one, plus two, plus three. At carbon, um, really group 4 doesn't form ions, and you'll even notice that like tin and lead fall into the group of making multiple ions. Okay, so this is when that group kind of doesn't work, doesn't follow the pattern, but it, you can use it to remember when it switches from positive to negative. Because after that, the nitrogen group forms negative 3 ions, negative 2 ions, negative 1. Okay. Let me just get this stuff out of the way. So, representative elements, those are the ones that have the known ions. If you haven't come up with a way of remembering that and how to use the periodic table to give it to you, you got to do that. The multiple ion elements, which are typically transition metals, okay, a good list to know, um, gold, chromium, cobalt, forgot to write in copper, iron, Mercury, ma manganese, nickel, lead, tin, antimony. If you know those, you'll be good. All right? I'm not going to throw out something other than those. The trick to these is that you have to remember that if you're writing the words for the formula, you must include Roman numerals. Whereas if you're getting the formula, you're going to see Roman numerals, which tell you the charge. Okay? The Roman numerals do not tell you how many you need. They just tell you that... One Roman numeral means that the charge is plus one, and you're going to have to cancel out that plus one. Okay. And then last thing is polyatomic ions. You're always going to get that chart. You don't need to memorize those, but you do need to recognize when they're there. Okay. So words, aside from I think four of them, they all end in some other ending other than "-ide". So like when you see phosphate, acetate, um... 
silicate, nitrite, okay, you know you're working with something. The other ones that end in "-ide", often sound like they have either multiple elements to them, like hydroxide, or they just clearly sound like something that's not on the periodic table, like ferrocyanide, okay? Um, but if you see polyatomic ions, that should just be 100% oh, I'm dealing with ions, because they don't ever form covalent compounds. General formatting for ionic compounds is two words. First word is always written as is. The only exception to that is you might need to add Roman numerals for a multiple ion, but you still write the name as is. Second word, if it's elemental, gains the ide ending, or if it's polyatomic, maintains its name. All right, so that's ionic compounds. Covalent molecules and compounds in my opinion, are simpler to know, but you have to be able to tell when it applies. Okay, so covalent molecules, if you're sitting there thinking about always finding charges, you're going to see that, like, oh wait, these both have a negative charge. Which means you can't cancel them out, so it means you're working with a covalent compound. Right? Because it's always going to be two nonmetals. Right? Like carbon and oxygen. Okay? So... They can combine in any combination, all right? And because of that, you can have more than one carbon-oxygen compound. There's carbon monoxide, there's carbon dioxide, okay? When you deal with, like, sulfur and phosphorus, you can have tons of different compounds, okay? So because of that, we have to communicate the number of atoms in the words. So that's where those prefixes come in. Second word will always have a prefix. Doesn't matter how many it is, it'll always have a prefix assigned to the number of atoms present. The first word will have a prefix as long as there's more than one. You only get to leave off the prefix when there's just one of that first atom. Okay? So if you haven't memorized these, you need to memorize your prefixes. All right? Most of them match what you learned in math class for polygons. Okay? I'd say the one that probably throws off people the most is tetra. All right? Tetra's four, not quad. Um... And similar to ionic compounds, there's always going to be two words, okay? First word generally will have a prefix unless it's a solo atom. And second word will always have a prefix, and it gets the ide ending, okay? And then as far as any kind of caveats or tricks to this, there are the three common name formulas. So you would, instead of writing out carbon tetrahydride, methane, is the name for CH4, right? You don't have to write dinitrogen monoxide. You can just call the H2O water. And then know that ammonia is nitrogen, or NH3, all right? Now, if you ever write these out with the typical covalent bond naming, I won't mark you wrong. The big thing is, is when I give you the word methane or ammonia, you need to know what the formula is. So... Ionic examples. Name to formula. So you have the words, you have to make the formula. You're always going to have to identify your charges. All right? So you, this is the step where you need to recognize if something is a representative element, if it's something that forms multiple ions, or it's polyatomic. All right? So sodium oxide. Sodium is in group one. Oxygen is in group 6. Those are your representative elements. So we know that sodium has a plus 1 charge. We know that oxygen has a two minus charge. All right? So part 2, I have to create a proportion that cancels out the charges. So I have more oxygen, so I'm going to have going to have to increase, I like I have more negative charge, so I have to increase the positive charge. So it's going to be Na2O. All right. So calcium and phosphate. Calcium is in group 2 on the periodic table. So I know that charge is going to be plus 2. Phosphate, it doesn't end in ide. That's a clue to me that I need to go to my polyatomic ion chart. Okay, and that's going to be a negative 3. 
All right. So, two, three combination. It's not an easy, I double one and it fixes. Okay. The two, three combination, if you just remember that plus six and minus six is going to make things work out. In order to get calcium to plus six, I need three of them. And in order to get phosphate to put minus six, I need two of them. Okay. The polyatomic ions do need parentheses so that the two applies to both the P and the, the phosphorus and the oxygen. Okay. So multiple ion and representative. So this is where you're going to see Roman numerals, and those Roman numerals tell you the charge. You never need to write Roman numerals into formulas. You only attach that to words. Okay, so if lead is has a charge of four, plus four, according to the Roman numeral four, and chlorine has a charge of negative one, means that I'm going to have lead and then four chlorines. Okay, I don't need the Roman numeral in the formula because I can tell that I have four chlorines, which makes a negative four charge, so therefore the lead has to be four. All right. So here I've got iron three hydroxide. So iron has a charge of three. Hydroxide is a polyatomic ion. It's one, one of the few that ends in ide. Okay. But you can kind of tell that it's not an element because it sounds like a mix of hydrogen and oxygen. And that's what hydroxide is. It's OH minus. Okay, so we have a negative one. So that means here I'm going to have Fe. And then put OH in parentheses. And I need three of them to cancel out the iron. And then last one, you may have a combination of two polyatomic ions. That's only going to happen if it has ammonium because ammonium is the only positive polyatomic ion. Okay, but this one would be ammonium has a plus one charge, and then chlorate has a minus one charge. So I'm going to have NH4, which is ammonium, and then I'm going to tack on to it chlorate, which is ClO3. Okay. So Ionic examples if you need to go from the formula to the name. And this is where it becomes important to ask yourself, am I working with a multiple ion? Because if it's yes, you have to identify charge and include Roman numerals. Otherwise, it's usually pretty easy. You just write out the name of the cation. Then if you need Roman numerals, you tack them on to the end. And then you identify the name of your anion, and if it's an element, add the ide ending. If it's a polyatomic ion, leave the name alone. Okay? So, potassium and sulfur. Potassium is not on my list of multiple ions, so I'm just going to write out potassium. And then sulfur, I have to drop the ending and add ide. So be sulfide. All right. So calcium and OH. So whenever you see things in formulas and you see, say, two capital letters right next to each other or a group of capital letters, that's generally a polyatomic ion. Because if it's there's a total of two capital letters in the formula, you know you're just working with two different elements. But if there's three, four, five, six capital letters, then we know we need to be checking our polyatomic ion chart. So Calcium is in group 2, so I know I just need to, that one's not a multiple ion, so I just write calcium. And then anything on the polyatomic ion chart, I always write the name the way it is. So this is going to be calcium hydroxide. Okay. So multiple ions and representative elements. So iron. That falls on that list of things that form multiple ions, which means I can't just guess what charge it is. I have to figure out the charge based on how much negative it's canceling out. Now, oxygen falls in group six, which means it holds a negative two charge, okay? Which means overall I have a negative six charge because there's three oxygens, which means overall I need a positive six charge, 
which means each iron, since there's two, is worth plus three. So I would write iron three, because it has a plus three charge. And then oxygen is the second word. It's an element, so I drop the ending and add ide. Oxide. All right. So next one, multiple ion and a polyatomic ion. Chromium is another big one that has many, many charges. Okay, so we have chromium and we have SO4, which is a polyatomic ion. We got two capital letters in there. Um, let's see, sulfate has a charge of negative two. Okay, which makes a total negative charge of negative four, which means my one chromium must be plus four. So I write chromium. Four sulfate, because polyatomic ions always keep their name. All right, then you could have a polyatomic and a polyatomic. Again, this is only going to work if you have ammonium, because it's the only positive one. So NH4 is ammonium. These are easy to write out, because you just write what you see. I have ammonium, and then NO3 is nitrate. Okay. Okay, covalent practice. This one's going from the name to the formula. All right, you just use your prefixes. Your prefixes tell me tell you how many you need. So tetraphosphorus means that I have four phosphorus, so P four. Hexachloride means that I have six chlorine. Okay, dihydrogen monoxide means I have two hydrogen and one water or one oxygen which also is water. Carbon tetrachloride, I have one carbon, because there's no prefix. And then tetra means four, so Cl4. Dinitrogen hexabromide, it's going to be N2, because dinitrogen means two, and hexabromide means six bromines. And then ammonia is one of the common names, something you want to remember. That is NH3. So, covalent practice, formula, and a name. You just do the opposite thing. You take the numbers you see in the formula and add the appropriate prefixes. Okay. So, first word will always have a prefix unless there's just one. Second word will always have a prefix regardless of how many there are. So, this is going to be dinitrogen. monoxide okay. and then pentaphosphorus decachloride there's one carbon since it's the first word I don't need mono so I just write carbon there's four fluorines, so tetrafluoride. And then sulfur, there's just one of them, so I write it out. And then two oxygens would be dioxide. And last one, CH4. You can name this one two ways. It is a common, it has a common name called methane. Though I will never mark you wrong if you called it carbon. Tetrahydride. And the problem is, if I give you methane, you gotta remember that CH4. Okay? So, you have a mix of everything. Okay? And a lot of times that's what you're gonna run into, because we'll have some compounds or some reactions that maybe are completely ionic, some that are completely covalent, and some that are a mix of both. Okay? It depends on what they make. So, we have selenium. First step is to identify what you're working with. Is it two nonmetals? Is it a metal and a nonmetal? Okay. One thing, if you see a polyatomic ion, guaranteed it's ionic. So, we have selenium and we have bromine. Se falls in group six under oxygen, so that's a nonmetal. 
bromine falls in group 7, which is also a nonmetal. So that means we are working with a covalent molecule. So this is selenium dibromide. Okay, hydrogen carbonate. We don't see an ion ending. That should be a clue to you. You've got a polyatomic ion. So this is ionic. Covalent ionic. So that means I need enough hydrogens to cancel out the carbonate. I know it says that hydrogen carbonate is HCO3-1 on your polyatomic ion chart. All right? But you never write, unless I'm asking for that ion, if I'm asking for a compound, it must be neutral. Okay, which means we need to find the appropriate combination of hydrogen and carbonate, which is CO3 minus 2, so that it's neutral. Okay. So that's actually going to be, since this is minus 2 and this is plus 1, we need two hydrogens. Okay. Potassium oxide. Potassium is in group 1, which is a metal. All right, I see a metal. Oxygen, you can confirm it. Oxygen is in group 6, is a nonmetal. Again, we're working with ionic. Okay, so I need to find my charges. Potassium is plus 1. Oxygen is minus 2, based on where they fall on the periodic table. So we have K2O. Calcium and chlorine. So calcium's in group two, which is a non-metal. Chlorine is in group seven, which is a sorry, calcium's a metal, chlorine's a non-metal. So that is a ionic compound. So we're gonna call it calcium chloride. You don't need the prefixes here because the only way you can correctly form calcium chloride is by doing one calcium and two chlorines. There's no other possible combination that's correct. Alright. So we have SN, which is tin, and that should click in your mind. It is a metal, but it's also a metal that forms a multiple kinds of ions. And then we have oxygen. So we know that the oxygen has a negative 2 charge, which means the tin must have a plus 2 charge. Okay, so this is going to be tin 2 oxide. All right dicarbon hexahydride. Well, based on the fact that there's prefixes here, that's got to be covalent. So it's going to be C2H6. All right. Manganese 6-phosphate. Right. If you see Roman numerals, that's another big indicator that you're dealing with ions. You don't use Roman numerals to do anything but show charge. So this is going to be a plus 6 manganese, and this is going to be a minus 3 phosphate. So it's going to be MnPO4, 2. And then aluminum oxide. Aluminum is a metal, oxygen is a nonmetal. So we're dealing with one more ionic compound. And aluminum has a plus 3 charge, oxygen has a plus 2 charge. So that's going to be one of those... 3-2 combos, which means we need total charge of 6 to cancel things out. So we need 2 aluminums to get to plus 6, and 3 oxygens to get to, sorry, minus 6. Okay. Really, what this whole thing is for is you're generally not going to name things solo. You're going to write things out into a reaction. You're going to have to balance them. Okay. So, you might have reactions that are completely ionic. Because if you look for, what is the formula for a double displacement reaction of sodium sulfate and calcium hydroxide? Okay. Double displacement means you're going to have two compounds and they're going to trade cations or they're going to trade anions. So, double displacement has to happen among ionic compounds. So we have sodium sulfate. Sodium has a plus one charge. Sulfate has that eight ending, so I know it's on my chart, which has a negative two charge. Okay. That should say calcium. Then calcium is on the part is in a representative group, so that has a 
2 plus charge and hydroxide has a minus 1 charge. Has an ide ending, but it is a polyatomic ion. Sounds like a combination of hydrogen and oxygen, hydroxide. Okay. So, sodium sulfate, to cancel that out, I need two sodiums. Na2, then sulfate is SO4. Plus calcium and hydroxide. Calcium has a 2 plus, hydroxide has a minus 1, so I'm going to need two hydroxides. All right. Double displacement means that my cations are going to flop. All right. So now I'm going to have calcium sulfate, which is plus 2 and minus 2, so I just need one of each. And sodium hydroxide, which are plus 1 and minus 1, so it's going to be NaOH. Last up, need the balance. Okay, so if you're looking at both sides, I have two sodiums to one sodium, one sulfate to one sulfate, one calcium to one calcium, and two hydroxides to one hydroxide. So if I put a two in front here, that balances everything. Okay. So there's where you have ionic compounds. What is the equation for the synthesis of carbon monoxide? Okay, so we want to make carbon monoxide. So our product is going to be carbon monoxide. All right, and then a synthesis has to be, you know, two things making one thing. So carbon monoxide is made out of carbon and oxygen. So we need carbon plus oxygen. Okay, I wrote the two there because oxygen is a polyatomic ion. Or not polyatomic ion. If... It's a diatomic molecule, okay? Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and all of the halogens are diatomic. You must remember that. If you don't, you're going to totally screw up your things, because otherwise it's going to look like it was balanced. And then in the end, it's going to screw up everything. Because to balance this, what we need to do is put a 2 in front of CO so that I have two oxygens. So now I have two carbons on one side and only one carbon. So I add another two here. Okay. Underneath this video, I've posted a bunch of links to some practice on this stuff. Do as much as you need until you get it. If you don't, and you never figure this out, the rest of this year is going to be painful. Okay?